Good morning and namaskar everyone. My name is Mohit. I welcome you all to this discussion with Ambassador Rajiv Dogra on uh, Duran's curse, which is the title of the book that he has written. And uh, it's based upon uh, his experiences, his research on uh, the curse line that was drawn on 12th of November, 1893 um, on the land of Afghanistan. Uh, so this, this is a beautiful uh, plot that he has created. I must say, if, uh, if someone doesn't tell you about whether this is a non-fiction book, you might read it as a fiction. And that's the kind of storytelling capability Ambassador Rajiv Dogra has. I will formally introduce him to you in a while, but um, I would also like to give a context before I uh, welcome everyone of you officially, as well as Ambassador Rajiv Dogra. It was in the last year that I picked up this book out of my sheer curiosity because when we hosted Ambassador Dogra for his book, which was on the Prime Ministers of India, which is uh, which was a remarkable tale of how the foreign policies are being shaped inside the Prime Minister's office. And that gave me a lot of curiosity and parallelly serendipity as it may be. Uh, I was reading about um, Harappan civilization, the Indus Valley. And um, so it was very important to understand, understand it from the present context. So much so that a couple of years ago, my interest in understanding the energy as a subject took me back to those, uh, uh, to, to those valleys, to that part of the world, which is still uh, 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 is rich in resources, especially uh, many of the gas fields that are there. And that all culminates back to the story, which is almost 128 years ago. And I must say uh, that it's just not 128 years ago when the Durans line was uh, made on a piece of paper. But I think there's a context of more than 200 year plus years, which has emerged out of uh, the imperial greed insecurity. And of course, uh, uh, the bigger insecurity was from Russia, the face. Um, so we, I welcome you all to this session today with uh, Ambassador Dogra. To introduce him, I will definitely use the back cover of the book. Uh, though he needs no introduction, many of his friends are here today. Many of the diplomats ambassadors are joining us in this call today. Many of our patrons of City Book Leaders are also joining us uh, right now. Uh, I would still uh, do a formal introduction to Ambassador Rajiv Dogra. He's a writer, television commentator, and an artist. Uh, that's where you can realize how someone writes a non-fiction with a flair of fiction. A career foreign service officer, he was India's ambassador to Italy and Romania. The permanent representative to the United Nations agencies in Rome and the last consul general in Karachi. And that's one story we would love to hear exactly what had happened when Benazir Bhutto had to actually uh, cancel and uh, close the consulate. And very recently, uh, sir, while we are talking about the encroachment of the consulate building that's happened uh, in Karachi, we would also be talking about it. He's an active public speaker. Um, he's one of the India's foremost commentators on foreign policy and strategic affairs, and is noted for his considered and assertive views. He's the best-selling author of Where Borders Bleed, which is regarded as one of the most authoritative books on India and the park relationships. Uh, so while we continue the session today, it's very important to, to set the tone of uh, the story and how it started. For that, I would like to project and will share some of the slides with you. Uh, so that's the book that we're going to discuss today. Uh, that's the line that is our point of discussion. And if you see, uh, Ambassador Dogra has very remarkably marked the Pashtun population in green and this is the most impacted region. Um, on one side, it's Pakistan touching some part of India, as well as on the other side, that's Afghanistan. And the red maroon line, that's Duran line, which was signed as the agreement was signed on 12th of November, 1893. So 12th of November is slightly interesting for me as well. It holds the relevance. I was born on 12th of November only, <laughs> but of course, not 1893. Uh, this is uh, a more detailed view of all the cities around it. We'll come back to uh, this map again when Ambassador Dogra would be presenting more thoughts around it. But before that, uh, let me take you into uh, history, which I was just mentioning almost 200 years ago. What had happened, um, Afghanistan and Britain actually fought three wars. The first one was 1839-42, 78-80. 
and then the 1990 which was the recent in the 20th century uh, all the three wars had different outcomes and of course the first two had different reasons as well which i just mentioned more of the insecurity of the british towards russia and that was a time when russia was also expanding in terms of its, its uh, imperialistic approach and part of the me too um, uh, consideration that they thought of doing around that early part of the 19th century now this is from the first war of uh, 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 the anglo afghan war uh, if you see uh, the background of this painting you will get a context of what we are trying to tell you that this was a war of the mismatch it was the war which was actually governed by geography so much so that this bolan pass will actually tell you what would have been the outcome uh, when someone is trying to enter into a pass like this and the first war actually resulted into um, a blood bath where only this one gentleman which was dr william bryden he was the only person who survived out of four and a half thousand plus of the overall a uh, number of soldiers that had gone into the first war uh, this is a painting by elizabeth butler that's what you see is the dr william bryden was only left to come back and tell the tale of the massacre that actually happened in the first war uh, then comes the second war uh, slightly ahead uh, this was around 1875 1880 75 in fact uh, robert uh, bulwer lytton became uh, uh the um, uh, took the control of uh, british india and he made some decisions and that's where uh, during this part in the late 19th century abdur rahman khan the amir of afghanistan had to sign the treaty alongside uh, sir mortimer durrell and in this entire story apart from the characters that i'm showing you there was a very important character which is Th sir thomas Sol salter pines and and he holds a very important relevance because he was the youngest to be given uh the knighthood and he was the spy who was part of uh, uh the amir's uh, overall uh, team so this makes it very interesting so much so that when ambassador dogra will tell you the stories around these characters you will all realize that this deserves to become the next biopic or the next netflix blockbuster uh also just to set uh, some part of the context more we will come back to uh, the maps i should also remind every one of you what was actually happening around that part of history this was the same period if you realize uh, uh, that the the wires were set between uh, the transatlantic had come in picture that was the same time when the oil was uh, decently discovered around many parts of america and the world was shifting in terms of its power and energy that was the same time uh, in the early 20th century that the right brothers and many other experiments around flying and also the naval systems that were building up across so the power was shifting from one place to other and the europe which was actually spread across in its terms of colonial capability was trying to experiment more in terms of grabbing more resources that they could and definitely that's exactly where the real play comes in when you are trying to hold something and especially india being uh, uh, was the crown uh, was 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 that diamond that they had, uh, britain had to preserve it was very important for them to take a control of that part of the country and that to while they were sitting in calcutta so much so that while after reading the book i asked uh, ambassador dogra sir is there a relevance of setting up delhi as the capital just after the duran line was signed and uh this war that happened uh, with afghans is there some correlation is there connecting the dot story between setting up of the delhi and also so much so that the world war 1 happened and in the world war 1 we all know just before that what was the financial condition of britain so much so that a lot of loans in terms of financial structuring was actually given by american companies and even the start of the world war 1 had no american presence it only happened towards the end of the first world war there is there is so much that you can actually relate just by thinking of duran line as one incidence which is actually very masterly packed into this book but actually it's just not one book that you will talk about or we will discuss about but this is many many other reference books that um, ambassador dogra has mentioned in this book and uh, before we start i would like to quote about when afghanistan has to be defined 
there could be no better person or the court to pick it up from the book which is actually said by alexander the great who said may god keep you away from the venom of the cobra the teeth of the tiger and the revenge of the afghans now that's exactly why i think the 911 really plays a very important role it's truly a serendipity that we are discussing it today but the revenge of the afghans is what we're going to discuss today i after setting up this context i hope i have made you clear about what is about to come um just because i am a novice in the history but definitely while we have ambassador rajiv dogra here i would now request um ambassador to present us his thoughts about the durans curse and we will also talk about the actual curse which resulted into a lot of carnage that happened thereafter ambassador dogra over to you please thank you so much mohit and thank you for arranging the weather so that more people can join in uh, i'm glad that they are there in uh, good numbers and i'm grateful to them uh, just one point uh, you made a reference to governor general litton uh, i understand he was the father in law of lutians who built delhi the new delhi uh, sir i think sir while, uh, while, you are, while you are setting up the context i must also say the durand cup that we now proudly play in india it was supposed to be partition between india and pakistan the durand cup lied with india so we still have one more correlation to go here sir <laughs> please uh the choice of the date today was also thanks to you more uh because i had not thought that it could be arranged so quickly and uh, at almost a week's notice but i'm glad you did it because uh the symbolism is important 911 represents the evil uh, and uh, to talk about what happened what just in america but to the psychology of the world i i, th- I think is is very useful uh, useful as a reminder that uh, we should not go down to uh, the forces of terror uh, which have really uh, been a huge loss to india in terms of human resources in terms of human lives and in terms of wasted opportunities but having said that uh, i think it's important that i also set the record straight as to why i wrote durand's curse because uh, i have been to afghanistan a number of times uh, but i was never posted there so i can't call myself an afghan specialist uh, the real reason was that after i had written their borders bleed about which i can claim to know something the publisher said ki sir ek aur kitab likh dijiye so i said look i have done my duty by with non fiction i like to keep on with fiction which i like very much he said no 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 you're non fiction you're known for it write another book so i said about what i said any subject anything you want to write. Uh, this was very strange uh, so i said no you have to tell me what should i write they said india pakistan next is afghanistan write something about that this is really how it started but as i started researching on it i got fascinated fascinated because of a large number of things and one of the first things i noticed was you mentioned about the second anglo afghan war there's an incident where a sikh soldier is has been shot he is dying he takes off his ammunition belt he takes out his rifle uh, from the injured arm to the other hands it over to his colleague another six soldier he says this is government property my brother take care of it now no one in history has talked about the sacrifices of indian soldiers uh, if a few thousand went to fight those uh, was from the british side the britishers there were multiple numbers of thousands from india who fought there and died but coming back to uh, durand's curse uh, the other fact which struck me was that almost every stone in afghanistan is soaked in blood so these two plus the third that the more i researched the more i found that there was very little about what happened when durand went there it is as if that part of history is blank why did it happen how did it happen there was almost nothing so 
it was this curiosity that led me to write uh, the book. Uh, you also mentioned about Alexander. In fact, I should start off with a series of mysteries about uh, Afghanistan. Alexander, when he was in Afghanistan, he received a letter from his mother, who was very anxious, like all mothers are. And she said that, look, you have conquered what is present day Turkey, Anatolia, Iraq, and Persia, Iran, in one year, all of them in one year. And you're stuck in Afghanistan for three years. My son, what has happened? So Alexander uh, wrote back a letter and also sent a sack full of the earth from Afghanistan. He said, uh, please spread it around your palace in Macedonia and ask the nobles, your advisors, to walk on it. Till then, the palace and their advisors, they were very tranquil. No one fought with each other. Uh, everyone was very happy. But the moment his mother spread the soil around the palace or asked her courtiers to spread the soil and people walked over it, they started bickering. So there is something about the soil uh, which makes people uh, what uh, unfortunately has become a part of the history. The second is a quote from, I mean, this was the soil, but there's something about the people also. And 2000 years later, Kipling wrote about the plants and he said that to Afghan, neither life nor property, law, kinship are sacred. He is a thief by instinct, murderer by heredity, easily uh, by morality. On occasion, he will fight without reason till he is cut to pieces. On other occasion, he will refuse to fight. So, what we have is both soil and people in a very negative way. Uh, but mark you, these are both the views of the West. Uh, Alexander and Kipling did not belong to East. What belonged to East was the Buddhist religion. And if you go to Afghanistan, some of the finest pieces of Buddhist sculptures and art are to be found there. Bamiyan Buddha, which is no longer there, was also representative of the Buddhist art at its greatest. So, obviously, it also depends on the point of view, uh, how you look at a people, how you look at a uh, particular place. And I think Afghanistan has been more sinned against than sinning. So, uh, I would say that let us not judge Afghanistan too hastily. Let us not describe its misfortunes as its own, but because of a combination of circumstances, or as Shakespeare would say, maybe it's the fault of the stars. It probably is. Uh, but moving on, the same thing about Pathans, uh, in, a, in a sarcastic way, intrigued the first Prime Minister of Pakistan, Liaquat Ali Khan. So, uh, in March 1948, when Pakistan was just about six, seven months old, uh, in the National Assembly, Liaquat Ali Khan asked uh, Bashar Khan, uh, Frontier Khan, the question, uh, is Pathan the name of a community or a country? Now, Bashar Khan's answer was very interesting. And it is relevant right uh, up to the date. He said... Uh, Pathan is the name of the community, and we will name our country Pakhtunistan. And I would like all Pathans on this side of the Durand line, meaning the Pakistan side of the Durand line, to join in in the United Pakhtunistan. Uh, the story doesn't end there because the curiosity kept on building. And Punjabis, uh, I'm a Punjabi myself, but not a Pakistani Punjabi. So a Punjabi journalist from Pakistan asked, Basha Khan's son, Wali Khan, uh, it, the same question in a different way. He said, are you a Muslim, Pakistani, or a Pashtun first? Now, uh, Wali Khan replied, I'm a 25, 27-year-old Pakistani. I'm a 1,000-year-old Muslim. I'm a 6,000-year-old Pashtun. So that reveals to you 
the nationalism and the pride that is there in every pashtun uh, but unfortunately they have not had a moment of peace now all this was uh, except for the exchange with basha khan and wali khan all this was history 2000 years old so on. my uh, point of view is that most of the miseries uh, if we leave aside uh, the various invasions which took uh, place in afghanistan because of india the uh, moguls the uh, mongols and hans and so on the recent history really of misfortune started in the 19th century and it started at the turn of 18th 19th century in a bizarre uh, kind of a way uh, when the amir of afghanistan wrote a letter to the governor then governor general of india uh, wesley uh, the amir was shah zaman and he said look i want to send a force to north india because i want to expel marathas from north india and i would like you to join in so instead of reflecting calmly over it the governor general wesley he got nightmares that he thought that now these wild beasts tribals from afghanistan will march all over india and cause mayhem here so he sent his representative to iran uh, to mediate and to control uh, the afghan amir uh, which he successfully did but that was one chapter a simultaneous chapter was starting in europe again this time napoleon decided that he will come down to india uh, on an elephant wearing a turban and he would want to start a new religion uh, so he approached the russian czar uh, also czar uh, paul and he said you provide 22000 men i'll provide 22000 soldiers and we'll go and conquer india fortunately he got distracted that didn't happen but paul one sent cossacks to march towards india fortunately for india fortunately for afghanistan and everyone is he sent them around the spring time when volga river was in a semi frozen state so a large number of horses and cossacks uh, down there and that was the end of them meanwhile paul one died and the new tsar decided that will call them back but two things happened around this time one british got scared they said now russians are coming and they will drive us out of india second till then britain was a sea power because it had conquered india by the sea route so now it started worrying about the land route also and the possibility of meeting enemies uh, on on the, the land border third thing which happened also was that the british started feeling that any moment russia would want to cross over into afghanistan in order to come down to india quite forgetting that till then russia did not have maps showing anything beyond kiva so for them to come down to india was not even dreamed of at that time but anyway once this kind of suspicion starts then there's no end to it and what happened then was that the suspicion and the ambition of some adventurous young british officers combined to drive uh, britain towards uh, a series of wars there were three wars which took place in afghanistan uh, most of them un- with unfortunate results for britain but i want to describe in a small detail what happened when the first british expedition to uh, afghanistan took this this called the first anglo uh, afghan war and it started in 1839 uh, mohit you described uh, a bit of it uh, in, in your introduction uh, but when the british army marched up uh, there were about 6000 of them men officers and soldiers british soldiers and uh, there were about 50000 uh, 
Indian soldiers and Indian retainers who were accompanying them. And there were 30,000 camels to carry the baggage of these 6,000 soldiers. Among them, 30 camels only to carry the cigars of these British soldiers and one camel only to carry the Odi cologne of these soldiers. So it was a luxury train, not really an army on march. And seeing this, the Khan of Kalat uh, in Baluchistan, he said, you have taken this army in into Kabul, but how do you propose to take it out? And a little later, a British colonel who was posted on the frontier area, uh, he said, uh, look, after you have reached Kabul and on your return, only one person would be alive to tell me that the rest are dead. Three years later, exactly the same thing happened. But history has a way of continuity. History has a way of leaving its mark. So the first Anglo-Afghan war was a disaster in every respect but it left its mark in multiple ways. Uh, and that is why I think it is important for us also today to remember that what started 20 years back has left its mark, the results of which are being seen today on 15th of August. So similarly, though the first Afghan war finished in 1842, but the consequence of it was that the Indian soldiers who had accompanied the Britishers realized that British could be defeated. Till then, the British were considered to be supermen who could not be defeated. In so 1857, in some ways, can be traced back to what happened to the British in the first uh, Anglo-Afghan uh, war. The second result of this was that East India Company lost its financial stability because of the huge expenditure, not just in war, but in expeditions prior to it and the expenditure thereafter. So in 1857, the British Empire took over. And that was uh, the end in a way of East India Company. A related thing was that though the war had ended, the suspicion continued. Because the tribal raids from Afghanistan continued the British, meanwhile, after Maharaja Ranjit Singh died, had expanded into his empire in Punjab. And they were worried that these Afghan tribals will keep on making our life miserable and maybe bring in foreigners like Russians and so on. So that paranoia resulted in the second uh, Anglo-Afghan war uh, that you mentioned about 1878 to 1880. Uh, in a way, that was also the lead for Durand, Mortimer Durand, to make his trip to uh, Afghanistan. And that is interesting because Mortimer Durand was not given the authority to go and grab territory. He was just given the assignment to go and negotiate with Amir because Amir was anxious to settle his northern borders, which means borders with Russia. And uh, he thought British intervention would help because they have some kind of a relationship with Russia. Uh, secondly, he wanted some kind of a, a, a message of friendship to be conveyed to the British. So that was the limited mandate. But there is a story behind it. Uh, the story is that the British had posted a doctor to look after the Amir Singh. And he had been sending reports that Amir tends to have attacks uh, which sort of paralyze him mentally and physically as soon as the winter starts setting in in Kabul. That means from October up to February at least, Amir is in an unstable state. So during timed his visit to reach Kabul in October. Uh, then of course the salt of pine uh, whom you referred to, uh, who became a great confidant of uh, the Amir, uh, had so much of hold over him that to date no one is able to explain why and how did he have that hold. But the result of all this was that Mortimer Durand 
had a very small team accompanying him. Uh, he was received at the border by Amir's bodyguards, but even though he was received and under protection, he also saw on the side that two men were buried in sand, only their arms and head was above it, waiting to die. Because that was a kind of punishment this poor Amir was capable of. A further ahead, he saw a cage in which some prisoners had been put and no food or water was to be given to them uh, because they were meant to die. So this was a king or an Amir who was cruel in the extreme, who was paranoid, who was suspicious of people and who was not willing to give even an inch of Afghan, Afghan land to anyone. In fact, he had increased Afghan land by three times during his kingship or amirship. So, what happened on 12th November 1893, no one really knows. Uh, I have only tried to, to uh, give circumstantial evidence on the basis of the research I could do. But a couple of things struck me. Before 12th November, Mortimer Durand assured the Amir that henceforth all the agreements <coughs> would be in Persian. Uh, only they will be officially recognized. Yet, when he presented the paper, it was a short one sheet with seven paragraphs which were written in English. Amir could neither read English nor write English. And he was made to sign on that paper. Uh, no Afghan official was allowed to be present in that uh, room when the ceremony was taking place and the agreement was being negotiated. There was only one person who was behind the parda, and that was an Indian. Uh, this was the father of Faz Ahmad Faz, a man by the name of Sultan Khan, if I'm not mistaken. Now, the other thing which is interesting is that Salter Pine, whom you mentioned, would not have been there, but for a Frenchman who got scared because his predecessor as an engineer on the job was a Frenchman who, when he arrived on the first day in Kabul, looked out of his window and saw people being whipped till they, they, they were blooded and uh, lay dead on the ground. So the first opportunity he got after a week or so to go and purchase something in England uh, or somewhere in Europe, he decided never to come back. And the result was a substitute had to be selected and Salter Payne went there. So if Salter Payne had not been selected, perhaps Durant's agreement may not have been signed. The second thing which intrigued me was Salter Payne was the youngest, as you said, recipient of OBE and perhaps the quickest because this agreement was signed in November and by January he had been given OBE for what? For being a junior engineer in someone's employ. Third thing which is striking is that everyone who was associated with this agreement ran away from Afghanistan. Salter Payne ran away. He never came back to uh, Afghanistan. Faz Ahmed Faz's father left overnight to go to Lahore and he was promptly imprisoned by the Britishers uh, till they got hold of all the notes that he had recorded. So no one knows what happened to those notes. And only then he was released. But the end result of all this is that Amir ended up giving 40,000 square miles of Afghan territory to the British. But mind you, even the agreement did not say that it was handing over of that territory. Because all it said was that this will be an area where British administration could exercise its influence. And the reason for this was the British anxiety that they should be able to police the area so the tribals don't trouble them in Punjab. But interestingly, over the years, the British got more ambitious. Uh, and by about 1947, they suddenly decided that they needed to do a favor to uh, Pakistan. And from area of influence, it became a border. And ever since, the problems for Afghanistan have not stopped. 
Afghanistan opposed the membership of Pakistan in the United Nations only because of this reason that they felt that this grabbing of territory was illegitimate. Successive Afghan governments have been uh, opposing uh, Durand Line and its recognition by uh, Pakistan. They have opposed the building of the fence, but they are helpless in a way because Pakistan is far too strong and has powerful friends like China and America who are supporting it. So fence has been built, but the families which have been divided have not given up the hope that one day this fence would be brought down and they can become part of the larger uh, Pakhtunistan. And at the moment, the fact is that because of this Durand line, there are larger number of Pakhtuns or Pashtuns in Pakistan, about 35 million or so, than in Afghanistan. Afghanistan has just about 17, 18 million uh, Pashtuns, uh, who incidentally are in a minority in Afghanistan itself. They are about 40%, the rest are Tajiks, Uzbeks, Hazaras, and so on. So, Durand's line is a curse that has not stopped giving trouble to the people of Afghanistan and will not stop giving trouble to people of Afghanistan because in my view, Taliban, after some time, are going to raise this issue as they had raised it in the first incarnation. So, uh, I will uh, once again repeat the quote that you had uh, given about Alexander uh, because it is very relevant. May God keep you away from the venom of Oprah, the teeth of the tiger and revenge of Afghanistan, Afghans, uh, because Pakistan's at some time or the other would have to face the revenge of Afghan, Afghans. They are a proud people, they are a nationalistic people. They will not forget easily what is happening to them right now, what is happening to them in terms of human rights abuses, in terms of pure torture of the Afghan soul. But more immediately, I think we also have to remember that Afghan tiger's bite is vicious and India should be aware of that. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Dogra. We're getting a lot of messages in terms of uh, the remarkable insights that you have given us today. Uh, I can only add that uh, this is one book that I have read twice and every time I read it, I, I thought, oh, how, how come I missed this? And each and every line that I've read out of this book, I had to search, I had to do a lot of Google. I had to even refer to some of the libraries so much so that I realized uh, we have our friends from Central Secretary Library as well. There's a remarkable chain of other readings that will come your way if you love in, love reading. And also you are an explorer in terms of the subject. Um, this is a remarkable tale, uh, Rajiv, uh, sir, that you have said. I would now request anyone if has any question, any comment, any anything to be discussed. I see um, many of your colleagues, Ambassador Dogra, they have joined us today in this call. So they might add in the new perspective. Yes, I see Mr. Mishra. Yes, I, I will open your mic and you will please ask your question. Well, thank you very much and congratulations to Ambassador Dogra on a very timely intervention and discussion uh, in these very troubling times when the Taliban is there. Is it there but not there? We don't know. Now, uh, the, uh, my only question is uh, what you ended with, and I was going to ask that. Will the Taliban, despite the support Pakistan enjoys from the international community, the U.S., uh, perhaps even the Russians, perhaps even the Chinese, and certainly the U.S. and others, the strong support they have. Will the Taliban able to have some traction on trying to dislodge the Durand line in any way in the next five or ten years? Or will history continue to stagger on in the same way to the disadvantage of the Pashtun identity? Well, thank you, uh, Jitu. Uh, that, that is a question which 35 million Pashtuns on this side and 17 odd million Pashtuns on the other side of the Durand line, I think ask every day. In fact, my book has been translated into Pashto and Dari 
and I believe some of the Talib leaders have been reading it. So uh, I hope it gives them some inspiration. But to answer your question, you know, the course of history is so difficult to predict because even if might is on Pakistan's side, the right is on Pashtun's side because they have a case that they have been cheated. Uh, neither geography nor history nor culture supports the Pakistani case. Uh, the Pashtun language is, is distinct. Pashtun culture is distinct. So they have been tricked out of a territory and out of a population that was rightfully theirs. Uh, how they do it in future uh, remains to be seen. But my experience of dealing with Pashtuns is that they are a determined people and they are a fearless people. So if they decide, as the first government of Taliban had also done, they had opposed the Durand line. And in fact, the first of their statements recently in the second incarnation is also to oppose the Durand line. They have qualified it by saying that we'll come back with a formal uh, statement on the issue later. But I expect that no government in Afghanistan will easily give up on this issue. Fantastic. I hope that gives your answer, Mr. Mishra. Um, we have got um, many more comments that uh, they are more praising. But yes, there is a question from Mr. Nilesh Sakhe. He's the former LIC chairman. I think his question is more related to the comparison to the Red Cliff Line and how it impacts the overall history. In, in comparison to? Uh, uh, Mr. Yeah. Sade, you can ask your question, please. Yeah, yeah now it's on mute. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Actually, it was uh, an excellent uh, uh, review of the book, and I'm tempted to read it. Uh, just as uh, you know, Pashtuns were separated by an artificial line whereby two-thirds of the Pashtuns are now in Pakistan and hardly one-third in Afghanistan. So was the case with uh, you, I mean Punjabis. And uh, the Red Cliff line, which was uh, actually drawn, has separated Punjabis between Pakistan and uh, India. I think it will be an interesting read if you can write something on that. So this is my request. No, no question as such. But uh, really a great work done because a lot of uh, actually history cannot be written without research. And you have researched it very well, it appears. I am really interested in reading the book. Well, thank you so much. Just to clarify, my first book, Where Borders Bleed, was exactly on the partition uh, on the Punjab side. It is not about oh. so much about uh, the eastern oh. side, though it was uh, mentioned in oh. passing, but really on the Punjab side and the effect how it started, in fact, how it started in 1920 and ended up in 1947 and the consequences uh, later. Yeah. So the partition has been covered in my first book. Very good. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Sate. Uh, we have a very interesting question, sir, for which, of course, I'm tempted to, to refer. Uh, that's a question by Sujata Mundra from Chennai. She's asking the question, what's the threat to India today? Um, in terms of uh, the present geopolitical situation that, that has happened. Um, I think uh, possibly the 1946 uh, uh, story about Nehru visiting the, uh, the, the province, I think that will give a very good context to your answer now, sir. I would you like to please answer this? What's the threat now? <laughs> so if I understand correctly, how, how was India connected to the partition uh, of, of the Pashtun lands and NWFP going to Pakistan. And also the threat that India might have now if uh, if, if this new regime has come in, uh, if, if there's a correlation to, to what had happened in the past and present, that's what I think the question from Sujata is. So very briefly about the first part, uh, you know, when uh, Pandit Nehru, against all advice, went to NWFP in 1946, uh, he had a rough time. Stones were pelted and slightly uh, misbehavior by, by uh, sponsored Pathan crowd. Uh, though Basha Khan was with them uh, and Governor General who was uh, 
biased against him, provided some security. But Nehru had a difficult uh, time there. So some people say that his disinterest in the entire issue of retaining, uh, you know, Pathan uh, support or NWFP started from that time. And it was also reflected in uh, uh, the decision of the Foreign Affairs Committee, which I've referred to, uh, where, where he was uh, not very enthusiastic about the entire thing. So uh, I think amongst some of the mistakes that this great man made uh, was this, which has not been adequately uh, addressed in books, uh, Kashmir and China being the other two. But uh, as for the present, uh, if I have understood the question correctly, I think we have anxious times ahead. Uh, Taliban has making the right noises in terms of asking India to continue with the development work and uh, to, to have uh, formal diplomatic relations again with their government and so on. Uh, all that is very good, but the record is not very happy. After all, Kandhar hijacking was under their regime and the 2008 bombing, which resulted in the death of uh, our senior officer and the military attache besides men was because of the Haqqani group. So the experience of past does not hold out much hope for the future till Taliban themselves show it by their actions, uh, which for the moment is not forthcoming. Uh, you know, even the evacuation of our diplomatic and official staff recently uh, was not easy. Uh, so it took 24 hours of negotiation before they could be taken out. So if they have really changed vis-a-vis -vis India, if they have no intention of sending uh, any of their cadres to India to, 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 to for whatever activities ISI may wish to promote, uh, then we, we will have to uh, judge them on their non-action and the next move can be made thereafter. But for the moment, I think caution is the watch. Perfect. So there's, there's uh, a couple of more questions on similar thoughts in terms of what India will do. But there's something on the ethnicity of the Pathans, and that too, that's coming from none other than Meru Zafar, who herself is uh, a noted scholar, the Islamic. Uh, she has been uh, teaching um, in various institutions, a very noted, remarkable author. Meruji, would you like to ask your question, please? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. This was such a fascinating uh, discourse, uh, Ambassador Dogra. Uh, you know, there's a lot of information available in writing uh, during the pre-Islamic history of what is Afghanistan today, uh, with very little mention of uh, Pathans. You know, there's a lot of mention of uh, the Arabs colonizing this part of the world, uh, the Turks, the Tajiks, and of course, the Persians, but um, not, not very little or none at all information about the Pathans. What is, uh, in your opinion, the ethnic origin of the Pathan and has the frustration of the, the, the Pakhtuns increased because uh, they have been divided off from their fellow Pathans and left to deal with Afghans of um, other ethnic uh, 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 communities. So what do you, what is your take on uh, on who the Pathans actually are before the formation of the nation state of the Af of Afghanistan. Well, uh, you know that, that is one of the first questions which uh, anyone wanting to write a book on a on a country or an area or a people uh, wants to address. And what I found uh, that there's no concrete evidence, but but there is. Uh, there are hints that uh, the Pathan origins 
can be traced back to Jews who, for some reason or the other, came and settled there. Uh, so, uh, and in fact, the last Jew has just left uh, Kabul a couple of days back. So, whether that is correct or not is is uh, uh, difficult to say. But uh, as far as there being other uh, ethnic uh, minorities in today's Afghanistan, when that is a geographical fact and a historical uh, fact also, because as you know, the real kingdoms or real empires at that time were based in Samarkand and uh, in today's Iran. So from there, the invasions came regularly into India and from there the populations used to spread onto the areas or the routes that these uh, invasions uh, took. So some got left behind, some uh, remained uh, in uh, the places uh, that they were and that is why uh, and some because of contiguity. For example, Tajiks are nearly 20% of Afghan population today because Tajikistan is next door neighbor to uh, Afghanistan. The other thing is that Afghan consolidation started only in late 19th century. In fact, Abdur Rahman was one of the first kings to preside over a huge united Afghanistan. So uh, like many other countries, the consolidation took some time and you're absolutely right. Uh, it was a series of fractions which got united uh, eventually. Perfect. Uh, I hope it answers Meruji for your question. There is a uh, very direct open question that has come from General Lakhvinder Singh. He's asking if the PM was to ask you for your views on the way forward, what would you advise? That's the question. I'm not adding anything to it. Well, uh, he is uh, my golf partner, and I know that his questions would be as sharp as his uh, as his accuracy in golf. Uh, well, firstly, I don't think PMO is going to ask me for advice. Uh, but more seriously, I, I think we should not rush into anything one way or the other because. Times are delicate. Uh, Pakistan, China uh, are very anxious that Afghanistan becomes a part of the larger scheme of strategic things. So uh, how it develops in future uh, and how the rest of the world reacts to this uh, shift which is taking place in Afghanistan uh, is very difficult to predict. But I think I will only, only uh, answer this and some of the other questions that might be there in uh, you know, your viewers' minds with one statistic. The previous Afghan government claimed that they had 300,000 soldiers on the Taliban claimed that they had 75,000 fighters. Uh, now, you have in all 375,000 soldiers come fighters who are extremely well trained, who are violent if necessary, and who are equipped with the latest in the armaments. If the Taliban regime cannot employ all of them, let's say they employ 60, 70,000 people uh, in their new army, about 300,000 or 200,000 or even 100,000 are unemployed, highly trained, violent individuals. If ISI wants, it can divert them anywhere in the world. So we have to be cautious with every utterance that we make because if we provoke Taliban too soon, we will have the counter effect, the reaction in terms of uh, physical presence of some of these people. Uh, if we are off our guard, again, we are in trouble. But if we don't have some kind of a contact with the Taliban, 
then we are leaving them to total control and advice of countries like pakistan as it is pakistan seems to be controlling most of their uh, major decisions so would we want another kandhar like situation where we are helpless because we had no contact with taliban so i think these are tricky times where we must not shut doors uh, to all uh, other options perfect so thank you sir i think um, while we are coming to the close of the session we still have 3 4 minutes i have opened the chat for everyone so whoever tuned in today if they wish to send their compliments their wishes their suggestions to ambassador dogra they can do it now it would go directly to not only to him but to everyone that's one way of uh, you sharing your thoughts on the chat that that's what you can do and while we are coming to the close of the session sir i think uh, i would like to read a line from the book which i thought is still relevant because though this line was actually written during the times of mortimer durant while he was thinking of how afghanistan should be treated and it's so relevant if you imagine that you are in a time machine and you have traveled back almost 128 years ago how will how will that look like it says the internal wars in afghanistan had weakened its government to such an extent that the country was regarded by foreign powers as a corridor or a buffer zone rather than a powerful sovereign land now imagine if you if you take this line just copy it and put it anywhere i think it will just fall true to it uh, so i think uh, the history is repeating itself and what you just mentioned about the stability of the situation and also the repercussion that can happen around that entire region and that to Uh, uh, at this particular time when the world has altogether seen a different kind of an economic turn uh, it holds a lot of relevance um, so my request to everyone is that this book is for policy makers this book is for people who are just plain curious about history absolutely like me this book is for even thinkers who believe that history may be able to give them some interesting lesson this book is for storytellers this book is for housewife this book is for house husbands like me uh so i would recommend this book to everyone and also to all the movie makers who are out there if there's someone who would like to recommend or commission this book to become a movie i would possibly be the first person to vote for that on that note uh ambassador rajiv dogra before we close any thoughts that you have uh, that you would like to give to the audience who came here today um it would be great well thank you so much mohit and thank you for asking me uh, for this morning i have enjoyed it greatly and i must say that uh, had i uh, known your skills at reaching out to people because we've had a tremendous uh, gathering today and very very high quality gathering so so uh, all compliments to you i just and, mentioned a uh, pakoda and a chai so it goes with the weather sir <laughs> and i i must say i'm also grateful to ambassador sham saran for his very generous comments form of foreign secretary so uh, all of you who have been here today uh, from uh, mrs Meh- mehru jafar to uh, jitu to everyone else to general lakwinder singh uh, all of you uh, grateful thanks and i hope you go by mohit's recommendation and buy the book by dozens so uh, thank you uh, mohit have a great day and let's hope the rain gods have some mercy now so there is a reason why i spoke about the food because to everyone who has tuned in today if you all are interested in knowing about our own country and the foods that are being served at the temples tomorrow we are doing a session which is called bhog navedya that's actually a very very fascinating travel book written by a chartered accountant herself and uh, her love towards travel has actually brought in a lot of insights from our own country so tomorrow in case you feel like the same time 11:30 do join us it would be a very fascinating session of course i may be able to deliver you a chai and a pakoda but she would be able to deliver you much much more beyond and more spiritual and religious thank you everyone for joining and uh, yet again thanks to all of you for tuning in thank you ambassador dogra like always it's always a pleasure we look forward forward to your next book and also the books of your entire family i must say and to whoever is tuned i would like to mention that uh, um his, his son in law is a remarkable author money mania that's the book he has written it's a fascinating story of 
the money the capital uh, that is there and his daughter radhika sarup yet again a very very interesting book she has also written. in fact two books that she has written so i would recommend uh, not only go for the author but the family of the author as well so thank you ladies and gentlemen thanks for tuning in truly a pleasure and our tributes to um, all the losses that happened in 911 and the world after thanks for joining in noshkar thanks